All right, guys, welcome to RC Mojo. This week, we're going to have a quick break from the Tamiya 1850L, and we're going to have a quick run through modifying a Flysky GT3C. The radio comes in a nice tidy box, nothing too amazing, but it'll keep it safe while it finds its way to you in the post. Out of the box, it's a three channel radio that runs on a lithium battery, which can be charged via USB. In some ways, it's nice and convenient, but you do lose out on being able to grab a set of double A's if you forget to charge it. Other than the battery, it's more or less the same radio as the older GT3B. The firmware we're going to be installing happily runs on either. In the box, we find a bit of standard office paper with the specs printed on it. Looks like it was done on an inkjet in draft mode. A bit odd, but there you go. The instruction sheet is a bit more fancy, being printed on glossy, thick paper, but other than the bind instructions, it's not really that useful. And once we've changed the firmware, it's going to be of no real use at all. Also in the box, you get an extra thick grip and a micro USB lead. Also with the radio, there's a neat little three channel receiver, which just leaves the transmitter itself. It's not a bad idea to run up the radio as it is and give it a bit of a test. It doesn't happen very often, but there's always a slight chance you'll get a defective one. When we're done, we'll be able to use the transmitter with these six channel receivers and even with these eight channel ones. You do have to be a little bit careful when you're buying the receivers as Flysky now have a new generation that doesn't work with the old transmitters, but they're still very much available and quite easy to find. Right, on to the mods. First, we'll pop the battery out. We're going to be fiddling around with the PCB, so we don't want it to have any power on. We just slide the door off and pull the plastic tab on the lithium cell. To get at the PCB, we need to pull out the little rubber plugs on the top that block the two screw holes. They're not glued in, and as long as you don't squeeze them too hard, they'll happily go back in, leaving no sign that the radio's been opened. Next, we remove the two screws that are under the rubber plugs. But the top still won't be free to remove though, there's a set of clips holding it in too. You could lever it off, but there's an even chance one or two of the clips are going to snap off. It's easier if you remove the three screws along the back just under the top. They're quite long, but removing them allows us to split the case near the top just enough to release the clips. If we work it apart and gently lift the top, it'll just pop out. Inside we've got the PCB and all its bits. On the right, there's the little STM8 processor that we're going to be reprogramming. There's the USB charging IC. It's the bit that manages and looks after the lithium cell. The big chip is the controller for the LCD. And the sub PCB on the left is the actual radio. There's really not all that much in it. The bit we're really interested in is the four little contacts on the right hand edge. Unfortunately, they haven't marked what the pins do. At least they haven't marked it on this side of the board. To double check the pins, we can quickly pop the PCB out. We remove the four small self tappers around the edge of the board and it just lifts out. And then we pull the LCD and backlight away from the board and we can just about see some markings on the silk screen. Now it's really difficult to get in video, but after fiddling around with my phone camera, I did get a fairly good picture. It's upside down, but bear with me. The unmarked pin is the power supply, so that's 5 volts. Then we have SWIM, or Single Wire Interface Module, basically the pin that transfers the firmware to the chip. Next is Ground, and then there's the Reset pin. Now you might get away without the reset, but connecting it means that the software we're going to be using on the PC can reset the processor as it needs to. I'll pop up a couple of pics with some annotations for the connections when we get to it. It's only four wires, so as long as you double check, there's not really much chance of anything going wrong. To connect to the PC, we're going to use one of these ST-Link V2 dongles. Now last time I did a Flysky firmware video, these weren't available, which does date it a bit. These little guys make the whole procedure a lot easier. On the case, it shows us what all the pins do. Now we only need four of them. The rest are for programming other processors like the ARM-based STM32. The four we need are all along one side, which is 5 volts, ground, swim and reset. Now usually when you get one of these programmers, they'll also come with a short socket to socket lead we can use to hook it up. Now on the transmitter end, we'd usually use some 0.1 inch pin header to make the connection. The idea is to pop the pins in and solder them on the back. Just popping the pins in really isn't enough as the connections won't be reliable. 
There's a way around it though. If you search for long 0.1 header, you should come across some of this. The gap between the pins is the same, but they're a lot longer than the standard stuff. We can do a dirty little trick of bending a couple of the pins just a little bit, so after a bit of a minor struggle, it stays in the holes and grips. It'll make the pins press to the outside of the holes, giving us a connection that will be just about good enough. Now we can connect up the four wires, and it's ready to connect to the PC. Here's the connections as an annotated picture and diagram. The picture of the board is fairly easy to see what's going on. And the diagram of the programmer is as if you're looking right into the end of the connector with the side with the keyway gap at the top. And now is probably a good time to pause the video if you're following along at home. Right, PC time. Now I'm using a laptop running Windows 10. Actually, it's not running Windows 10, it's running Linux and Windows 10 in a virtual machine. But for the sake of the video, it's just a Windows laptop. Before we plug the programmer in, we need to download and install some software. Open up a web browser and do a search for STVD STM8. The first hit should take you off to the ST website and show you info about the software. We just need to scroll all the way to the bottom and click on Get Software. That will bring up the license agreement, which we need to agree to. Then we get the login or register dialog. Now you can use your real name, but it works just fine if you put something random in. But you do need a working email address as they will send you a link to the download of the program. It's worth noting that the installer is available on other sites around the net. But keep in mind these aren't coming directly from ST, so there's no guarantee that they won't be infected with something dodgy. If you get the software direct from the source, you'll be about as safe as you can be. Also, if you're running Linux or Mac OS and you don't mind some more advanced computing, there's an open source tool called STM8 Flash. You need to compile it from source and it's command line only, so it's not all that friendly for regular users. Anyway, once you've received the email and clicked on the link, you'll end up with a zip file with the installer in. Now I've just stuck it on the desktop so it's easy to find, but usually it'll end up in your downloads folder. We can right click on it and choose Extract All, click on Extract, which should end up opening a window with the installer. We just need to double click it. Now because it's an installer that's going to install drivers, it needs permission to make changes, so click Yes. All being well, you'll get a nice ST splash screen followed by the install wizard. Now after the first progress bar, if you don't have Acrobat Reader installed, it will warn you. I'm using a bare minimum Windows install, so I don't have any extra software, but we don't really need it, so we can just click on OK. Now we've got the wizard running properly. If you've ever installed anything, there's nothing really to worry about. We just click Next and agree to the T's and C's. We can leave all the optional bits as default, so type is just standard tools. The install path is fine, it's just going to pop it in program files or program files x86, whichever is appropriate. If you like having program shortcuts on the desktop, leave this one be, otherwise tell it not to. It will put an entry in the start menu either way. This time when you click next, it will do the actual install. It's going to take a couple of minutes, so we'll fast forward. When it's done, click finish and close the explorer window. Now with the software installed, it should all just work. If we plug the programmer into the USB port, the radio will power itself up. Now it might start beeping as it thinks the battery's flat. It's annoying, but it really won't do any harm. So for the sake of our sanity, I'm going to mute the audio for the time being. If it's all working, you should find an icon in the system tray at the bottom right that when clicked on has an option to eject the ST link. If it's not there, you might need to reboot the PC to get the driver loaded. Now we can load up the software from the desktop icon or the start menu, which greets us with some options with some rather long lists. Now it's really not as bad as it looks at first. Starting on the left under hardware, we know we have an ST link, so that's what we need to select. Under port, the only option is USB, which is what we're using. For programming mode, you'll recognize swim, so we select that. The last option is the device. Now this is the part number of the STM8 processor in the radio. Now you could try and read it off the top of the chip, but some helpful soul put a blob of green paint over it. Luckily all the GTs have the same chip, so we just need to find the STM8 S105 X6. 
I'll pop it up on the screen in some bigger text, just in case it's difficult to read in the video. So with those bits set up, we can click on OK and it will drop you into the main program. Now there's lots of buttons and information in here, but we can ignore almost all of it. We only need to use a few of them to change the firmware. But before we do that, it's not a bad idea to make a backup of what's currently in the radio. You might want to go back to the stock firmware, or if something goes wrong, it might be helpful if you have it on file. The STM8 has three memory areas that we need to save. First is the program memory. Now the memory areas are shown in three tabs just below the hex view. So with program memory selected, we can click on the read button in the toolbar. It's the one with the low res picture of a microchip and a green arrow coming out of it. If it worked, you'll see the hex view has changed and it's now showing the program. It's in machine code, so it's not going to make a lot of sense. To back it up, all we need to do is go to the file menu and click on save as, just like a normal document. We'll go to the documents folder, then make a new folder called GT3C Backup. You can of course put them wherever you want, but this will do for the video. We're going to call the file GT3C Program. Click on Save, and that's the program backed up. Now you can get away without backing up the other two memory areas, but for the sake of completeness, we might as well do it anyway. If we click on the Data Memory tab and click on the Read button again, it'll load the contents of the data memory. Now we just do File, Save As, and call the file GT3C Data, and hit Save. Same with the Option Byte tab, it really doesn't need backing up, but we might as well. So with the Option tab selected, click on the Read button again, then File, Save As, call it GT3C Option, and hit Save. Right, so now no matter what we do, we've got the file, so we can always go back to how the radio was. We can close the STM8 software for the time being, and we can bring up a web browser. This time we need to search for GT3C firmware. Now most of the top hits are videos of the mod of course, and we've got some forum threads. And below them we have a hit that takes us to the user Semerad on github.com. This is where the firmware lives. If you find it elsewhere, there's no guarantee it hasn't been messed about with. On GitHub we find lots of files. Most of the ones you see right away are the program files themselves. The firmware was written in C, so if we look at main.c by clicking on it, you can see the code that makes it go. Fortunately, we don't need to worry about all these .c and .h files to change the firmware on the transmitter. If we go back to the file list and we click on releases, we find lots of S19 files. These are the files that contain the raw data that we need to send to the radio. Effectively, these have the machine code instructions the processor actually runs. The one we want is pre-release 062.s19. Now it might be a pre-release, but it seems to be perfectly stable and widely used. Click on it, which will take us to the page with lots of numbers on. Right click on the raw button and choose save link as. This tells the browser to download the s19 file. We'll want to make a new folder for it somewhere near the GT3C backups. I'm just going to call it GT3C firmware. Open the folder and hit save. Right, nearly there. We need to load up the STM8 software again. This time it'll remember the settings from last time, so it should come straight up in its main window. Make sure you've got the program memory selected. Now we do File Open, navigate to the Documents folder, then the GT3C firmware, and open up the S19 file we just downloaded. The hex area at the top will populate with the data, and interestingly the ASCII bit on the right shows us the guy's name and the date embedded in the code. It's a nice way to tell if you've got the right file. It's also handy if you ever need to check what firmware is installed on a radio if you read it back. All we do now is hit the program button, this time with a red arrow pointing towards the chip. It should only take a couple of seconds to complete, and when it has, we want to see Program Memory Successfully Verified right at the bottom of the window. If so, you've got an upgraded radio that will do 8 channels. There's nothing to do with the data memory or the option byte, so we can close the program and unplug the programmer. Pull the bent pin header from the PCB, and we just need to reassemble it. The top section with the PCB just folds back up and we can squeeze the case so all the clips go back together. 
reinstall the three screws along the back and when you're doing these up the case will probably creak and crack a bit as everything lines itself back up which just leaves the two short screws on the top followed by the orange bungs. Now before we install the battery we're going to need to check its voltage. Using a multimeter we need to probe the outside two contacts. It's all marked on the case which is positive and which is negative. Now we expect to see 3 point something volts. In this case we've got 3.87 which we're going to round down to 3.8. Right I'm actually cheating a bit here as I've already used the radio with the new firmware and I've set up a model. Usually on the first power up it should enter calibration mode. If it doesn't, all we do is hold the steering wheel all the way to the right and hold the button on the scroll wheel down until it says Cal, then let go. After a couple of seconds, you'll see channel 1 and a number around 500. We need to tell the radio how far the wheel can move and where its centre is. It's really simple. All we need to do is turn the wheel all the way to the right and hold it for a second. Turn it all the way to left and hold it. Then let it spring back to its centre point. To save it, all we do is click the scroll wheel button. Now if we scroll one to the left, we get channel two, which is the trigger. We just follow the same routine, but this time pull and push the trigger before clicking on the button. There's not much point in doing anything with channel three because it's just an on off button. However, you can modify it for another analog channel by fitting a pot, in which case you'd need to calibrate. Channel four is a bit of an odd one as it's not one of the control channels, rather it's the battery. This time with the number on the screen, we do a short press of the scroll wheel and it will change to a voltage. This is where we need the voltage that we read from the battery, 3.8 volts. We just need to use the scroll wheel to set the voltage, then click the scroll wheel. There's nothing else we need to do for calibration, so we can press and hold the scroll wheel until we're out of the calibration menu and release it. Now that would be it for a GT3B, but on the GT3C it thinks the battery is now very low. So we need to change the voltage warning level. Luckily it's fairly easy to do, even if you'd probably never figure it out by using the manual. On the main screen with none of the items selected, hold the scroll wheel down until model and home start flashing alternately. Scroll left until you see a voltage. Click the scroll wheel and roll it until you get 3.0 volts, which is about as low as you'd want to go with the lithium cell. Click the scroll wheel again and press end. That should stop the constant beeping, which is always nice. So that's one GT3C upgraded to eight channels from start to finish. Once you've done it once, the second time is really quick to do. It's just a case of connecting up the radio, loading the software, opening the firmware file and programming the chip. The difficult bit is now deciphering the manual, which by the way is available on the same GitHub page as we got the firmware from. It takes a few goes around to get used to how it all works. It's a great radio for the money once it's been upgraded, but the LCD does limit the user interface a bit, so it's not always clear what's going on until you learn the menus. When you do though, it's a very powerful bit of kit for a 30 quid radio. Right, that's it for this week. And looking at the length of what I've just typed out, I've put far too much waffle in. So much for doing a quick video. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching. Like if you liked, subscribe if you haven't, and leave a comment if you got something to say. Bye guys! Bye.